this is a message for the creative and the curious souls out there. So have you heard of the podcast, Your Own Magic? Your Own Magic is a podcast with hundreds of expansive guests from artists, authors, poets, activists, musicians, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, spiritual and intuitive guides, and so many unique specialties with people sharing their magic to stimulate your curiosity and excite you in the exploration and unleashing of your own magic. And I must say it is wild what you were able to heal and reveal within yourself when listening. So while you're tuned into the podcast you're currently listening to, search for and save for later the podcast Your Own Magic. It is hosted by me, Raquel Mantra, and tune in every Monday wherever you listen to podcasts. episode 177 of real life ghost stories to kick things off this week i need to thank some of our newest patreon subscribers i would like to thank jillian lorraine Brittany gonzalez emma m debbie thompson jessica chalice krista snyder devon c keeks vanessa turk kathleen barnard lisa jordan rochelle b lopez danny bird Carrie Phillips, Stephanie Edmonds, Kimberly Dara, Natalie Bear, and Alexa McFarlane. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is The Black Phone. The Black Phone was released in 2022. It has 7 out of 10 on IMDb and 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. Finney is a 13-year-old boy who's been held captive in a soundproofed basement by a sadistic masked killer. When a disconnected phone on the wall starts to ring, he soon discovers that he can hear the voices of the murderer's previous victims. So like always, we're going to try and keep this short and sweet, and I'm going to start with my likes column. And look, I was pleasantly surprised by this film. I wasn't expecting that much from it, not going to lie. I thought I was going to find it a bit meh, but I was pleasantly surprised. It is very... Stephen King-esque. Now I haven't read any Stephen King books but I've obviously seen the new It chapter 1 and chapter 2. I've seen Pet Cemetery. I've seen Doctor Sleep, The Shining, like various ones and this felt like a real Stephen King coming of age story. It had definite like It vibes. You've got the, the lives of the kids being explored and actually the violence that children are subjected to in their everyday lives, like from each other and from adults in their lives and from their peers. So actually, I thought as a coming of age story, it was a really interesting story. There is a girl in it called Gwen, who is Finney's little sister, and she is an amazing character. I absolutely loved her character she was funny she was feisty she took no shit from anybody there's a great scene where she just hurls abuse at two police officers and calls them very inventive names and I thoroughly enjoyed it there's also a great scene where her brother's being beaten up and she runs in with a rock and she's just a really good character and actually what I enjoyed the most about their their kind of character arc and finding out about Finney and Gwen is that they have this really complex relationship with their dad Uh, Their dad is quite violent towards them. You learn that from the very beginning. So that's not a spoiler or anything. But actually they made the dad quite a nuanced character. Uh, I would never ever in a million years condone any sort of violence against children. Uh, But actually you learn that he's quite a complicated man as as the film goes on. Which I thought was interesting because it's very easy to just make characters black and white. Particularly in horror films where you have good guys and bad guys. I don't want to say like too much about the plot because it's a relatively new film. Uh, But I thought the use of the phone was great. Really, really great. I thought it was really clever. I thought it was an interesting concept and I thought it really introduced the horror element. Uh, It allowed for the film to be scary in a completely different way, which I thought was really good. 
Like I wanted to know what was going to happen when the phone rang. You know, I was I was ready for it. I was into it. And I know this movie is based on a short story, a really famous short story. So I haven't read the short story, so I don't know how true to the short story it is or how much it expands upon the short story. But actually, I thought as a concept for a film, I, I thought it was really refreshing. I thought it was clever. I thought it was engaging to watch and it was fun. And now on to the dislikes. I hate bullying storylines in films I've talked about this countless times however I think the bullying aspect of the beginning of this film was done very well Uh, but honestly for the first 20 minutes of the film it just felt like everybody was beating each other up (laughs) and I I wasn't into it you know I wasn't into it I, I I struggled with everybody beating each other up the level of intensity of the everybody beating each other up was was stressing me out as well. It wasn't okay. I know they were setting a scene. I understand why it was there so we could learn about Finny and Gwen's lives and the lives of the children in the town. I get it, but God, everybody's just been beaten up for ages. I, 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 was, I didn't want to see anybody else getting beaten up. And admittedly, I do have to say some of the young actors were questionable and I thought that really took away from the performances of the two main actors who played Gwen and Finny. Like there were points where there were some really cool characters, like kids who could have been really cool characters and actually just, they just could have gotten better child actors, to be honest. Because then I was a bit like, oh, you're a bit shit and I don't believe your character now. And speaking of characters that were a bit shit, I was really disappointed with Ethan Hawke's character, which was the grabber. A scary mask does not a scary man make. And the grabber frequently wears different masks that are really horrifying. They are genuinely really scary masks. Uh, So much so that I'm doing a show kind of in the next year or so. And I wrote down to look into the masks that were used in this film. Because I thought they were really genuinely terrifying. But I just don't think Ethan Hawke did very well. I felt like he phoned it in. See what I did there? He had the potential to play this really scary, unsettling, eccentric, mad serial killer. And actually, I didn't really care about, didn't really care about the grabber. Wasn't really freaked out by the grabber, only because of the masks. And I wanted to know more about him. Like, I understand that the story was told from the child's perspective, who didn't have the luxury of knowing anything about his captor and was just trying to survive, right? I I understood that completely. But I just didn't think that Ethan Hawke was as good as he could have been. I thought it was it was pretty much a gift of a role to be given. But I really didn't feel like he sold it to me, to be honest. Didn't feel like it. Was very disappointed. Ethan Hawke, if you're listening, I'm very disappointed in your character, I have to say. Overall, I think I, I, think I really enjoyed it. I was engaged. I thought the story was new. It was interesting. It was freaky at times. It was it was good. It was a genuinely good story. Um, I think I'm going to give it four out of five. Yeah, I think I am. I was going to give it three and a half. But actually, I think some of the child actors were amazing. I thought some of the jump scares and stuff were good and not overused, which always annoys me, as you guys know. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it four out of five. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. I cannot keep risking life and limb in this zombie apocalypse to go to the grocery store. If only there was an easier way. Wait, what's this conveniently placed leaflet? With HelloFresh you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and the impending zombie doom and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You know what will really take your mind off the flesh-hungry horde? Fast and fresh recipes. HelloFresh's latest line of meals featuring robust flavours and filling portions are ready in less than 15 minutes. Enjoy taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce or southwest pork and bean burritos and let's face it, In the zombie apocalypse, we gotta cook smart and we gotta cook fast. And you know what? 
We don't all want to be out there fighting our way to the store so you can stock up on snacks, sides, desserts and more at HelloFresh Market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order and they'll arrive on your doorstep along with your meals. More yummy food, less mortal peril. Fictional zombie apocalypse aside, I have actually used HelloFresh in real life for years and I love it. I used them long before I ever advertised for them. It saved me so much time, so much money and so much food waste. I'm also not a very good cook, so it allows me to cook and eat better. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use the code RealLifeGhostStories22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use code Real Life Ghost Stories 22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Oh no. Oh no, what is that? Oh no, no, it was meant to be fictional. It wasn't meant to be real. Which brings us to our stories this week. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of different little folkloric tales this week because I've spent the week in Suffolk which is in the east of England with the Poisoner's Cabinet Nick and Sinead and we went to Suffolk in search of some folkloric tales I made a vlog while we were there which will be out at some point this week and I got into researching some of the Suffolk folk tales and honestly they are absolutely amazing before I even start telling you today's story I need to give a massive shout out to the East Anglian Daily Times who do amazing stories about weird events in Suffolk and I'll talk about it more after the stories but just keep that in your brain while we're doing this episode and I'll talk to you about it at the end and it's definitely worth checking out. Suffolk is a beautiful county on the east coast of England. It is a low-lying county and the sea can be rough and grey and it is a county that is full of strange and wonderful stories. In 1939, in the east of the county, in a place called Sutton Hoo, a huge Anglo-Saxon burial ship was uncovered intact, which contained a collection of treasures. There have been numerous famous archaeological hoards in the area, including many, many skeletons and burial sites. In 2019, an excavation of a 4th century Roman cemetery in Great Weltenham uncovered unusual burial practices. Of 52 skeletons that were found, a large number had been decapitated, which archaeologists claimed gave new insights into Roman traditions. The burial ground included remains of men, women and children who likely lived in a nearby settlement. The fact that up to 40% of the bodies were decapitated represents a rare find. But it's not just objects from our past that are found in the stories of Suffolk. There are stories of aliens and monsters, of cryptids and ghosts and women who burst into flames. This week I spent some time in Suffolk exploring the sites of these strange and wonderful stories and I was frankly shocked by the sheer amount of stories. Every little town or village that we went to was awash with freakish tales. It's not the first time we visited Suffolk on the podcast. In episode 131 we looked at the Rendlesham Forest incident which is hailed as the UK's Roswell. And while I did visit the Rendlesham Forest while I was there, we won't be revisiting that story today. But we will be looking at a series of strange little tales, starting with the Merman of Orford. There are some stories that shape a community, and the story of the wild man or the Merman of Orford has done just that. It could easily have been a story that was lost to the ages, But the wild man is still visible wherever you go in Orford. Glimpses of him in shops and in the marketplace, on plaques and on the font in the church. Although that might just be a standard depiction of the green man. But it might be something else. But I digress. In the 12th century in Orford, fishing was the main source of income. The people lived a life that was ruled by the sea. And they learned to understand and respect the sea but also to fear it. The sea brought food in abundance, but storms rolled in over the water, storms that could make whole towns disappear, and people were all too often sucked under the waves, never to be seen again. On this particular day, the fishermen made a discovery that would change the face of Orford forever. The sea was relatively calm and kind on that day, as the nets were hauled in the fishermen immediately noticed 
that they were much heavier than usual. Was it a particularly abundant catch, or had something else been trapped in their net? As they hauled the net onto their boat, they were shocked to see that among the flopping fish was a man. A man that seemed to have been dragged up from the depths, and a man that was unlike any man they had ever seen. He was glistening and covered in hair, and while he was definitely humanoid, he had a distinct air of being something otherworldly, like something that existed outside the realms of normal life. He was incredibly hairy and he looked dishevelled. The hair around his face and mouth was particularly thick and almost seemed to have the consistency of pine needles. His hair wasn't quite the same as human hair. His chest was covered in long thick hair and he said not a word. The fishermen were terrified and they decided to bring the creature to the land and to present him at Orford Castle. Bartholomew de Glanville would surely know what to do. When they arrived at the castle, Glanville decided that the best course of action was to imprison the merman in the castle and try and learn as much about him as possible. It soon became very clear that the merman could not speak. It was not that he spoke a different language, but he simply had no language at all. The merman was tortured and tormented, but there was no sign that he could communicate at all or understand anyone around him. The torture stopped, and Glanville decided that the next logical step was to take the merman to the local church. But the merman showed no sign that he recognised or understood any of the Christian symbols, or indeed he seemed to show no sign that he understood where he was or the significance of the building. There seemed to be no conceivable explanation as to who or what this creature was, and he spent three months in total in Orford Castle as a captive. He was not interested in cooked food, and instead survived on a diet of raw fish. He had no interest in drinking water, and would instead wring out the fish, squeezing all of the fluid from it, and drink that instead. He never developed language and eventually he was allowed out in the harbour to swim, hunt and exercise. And despite his incredible ability to swim and dive, repeatedly demonstrating that he could easily dive beneath the three heavy nets designed to keep him in, he always returned to his captives. Until one day he didn't. He just swam under the water and he never returned. The merman of Orford was never seen again. But the story was documented, written down a mere 30 years later, by an abbot named Ralph of Coggeshall, who wrote, As to whether this was a mortal man, or some fish pretending human shape, or was an evil spirit hiding in the body of a drowned man, as can be read in the life of the Blessed Owen, it is not possible to be precise. The more so because so many wonderful things of this kind are told by many to whom they have happened. It's possible that the story is simply not true, of course. But in researching this story, I came across something far more interesting than just stating it's fake and moving on. I briefly mentioned earlier that there was an alleged carving of the merman or the wild man on the font of St. Bartholomew's Church. And I asserted that it was more likely a carving of the green man, which is often found in churches. Or maybe it was something else. There are legends all over Europe of the wood woes and there are many who believe that wood woes appear in many church carvings. That wood woes are intrinsically linked to stories of the green man and that perhaps the merman of Orford is actually a wood woes. But what is a wood woes? A wood woes is a term that is used to describe mythical creatures that live in the woods all over Europe. Some people compare them to Bigfoot, but in actuality they are much more human than ape-like and seem to be linked more to fairy folk than to cryptids. Is it possible that the wild man of Orford was a genus of wood woes, a seafaring member of a branch of the fairy family? Or was it simply a man who did not fit into what is considered normal society and was therefore considered to be otherworldly? We'll never know now but the legend of the Merman of Orford still lives on 800 years later. Coastal folk know the dangers of the water. The sea can throw up strange creatures like the Merman 
or even Black Shuck. And like I said, the sea has the power to swallow cities whole. Like the town of Dunwich. Today, Dunwich is home to around 200 people. But at one point, Dunwich was the biggest town in England. In the Middle Ages, Dunwich was as big as London and was a thriving port with direct links to Europe, meaning that it was bustling and wealthy. But a massive storm in 1286 swept away the monastery along with many homes and other buildings. The crumbling stone walls you can visit today are the remains of the new friary rebuilt in the late 13th century on land half a mile from the sea. They now stand perilously close to the edge of the cliffs, illustrating how storms, surges and coastal erosion turned the tide on thriving Dunwich, some of which was later built on higher ground. In the intervening years, a legend arose that the medieval town remained intact below the surface of the water, Britain's very own Atlantis. Locals have even claimed that at certain stormy times, you can hear the church bell ringing from under the waves. And while it might be expected that the town under the waves would have long since broken up and been washed away, fishermen repeatedly reported their nets and line being snagged on something below the waves. And in the 1960s, a diver saw the church still standing there, now pink, covered in sea sponges, crawling with crabs and lobsters. In 2008, sonar was used to determine that the lost town of Dunwich was indeed still there, just as the old stories and maps told. And while there's nothing paranormal about this story, it reinforces two things. Firstly, that there is often an element of truth in these old stories and folklore. And secondly, that people were right to respect and fear the sea. The sea could give, but it could also take away. And while we're not going to delve into the story of Black Shuck in this episode, for those who don't know, Black Shuck is a legendary giant dog who terrorised the people of East Suffolk. It is important to note that local people genuinely believed that it was the storm that spelled Dunwich's demise that brought Black Shuck to the shores of Suffolk. But a giant black dog terrorising innocent churchgoers is not the strangest thing to have happened to the people of Suffolk by a long shot. It was the year of 1405, and it was a clear and crisp spring day. The people of Sudbury were busy with their daily chores and tasks when something emerged from the horizon and engulfed the people like a tsunami. It was a wave of panic, a wave of fear, and it spread in hurried whispers over the town. Something had emerged from the river Stour. Something horrible. Several people had seen with their own eyes that an enormous monster had come from the water and breathed fire on any living thing that came across its path. The townspeople fled to their homes and the air was ringing with the sounds of doors being locked and bolted and window shutters being slammed as people cowered in their homes desperate not to be a victim of this mysterious monster. But despite their fear, the menfolk of the town knew that the town and its people needed to be protected. They rounded up the best hunters in the town and armed them with bows and arrows and slowly and cautiously they made their way towards the river. There it was, by the side of the river, huge and hulking and menacing, all teeth and scales. And the men took their positions expertly hidden from view. They raised their bows and on the signal they began firing arrows at the monster. But their arrows did not pierce the flesh of the beast, instead they bounced off its tough scaly skin, falling to the ground below. While the beast seemed unscathed by the attack, it was definitely bothered by it, and agitated it retreated into the water and once submerged it disappeared. The following account of what happened next is taken from the East Anglian Daily Times and was written in August 1976 by Robert Hadgraft. News spread of the dragon's presence in the river and villagers fled in terror. In Bures, the creature appeared at an area called Clappets and promptly killed most of a flock of sheep and the shepherd tending them. 
It then set up temporary residence at Sir Richard's home, Smallbridge Hall, at which point the men folk of the village decided to take action. Armed with bows and arrows, they launched an attack on the dragon but failed to cause it any harm as the weapons bounced off its tough, scaly skin. Retreating for tactical talks, the villagers gathered forces and the entire population from miles around got together and set off to tackle the beast en masse. Realising it was outnumbered, the dragon decided to flee. It was seen to hurriedly make its way overland and on foot to the village of Wormingford, where it plunged into a mere never to be seen again. One version of the story has it that the bowmen who made the attack at Bures retired to the Eight Bells public house to enjoy a hearty meal of the sheep, which had conveniently and deliciously been roasted by the dragon's fiery breath. The only account to survive that was actually written at the time appears to be contained in the chronicles of monk John de Troclo. His writing was, of course, all in Latin and was later translated into English. The monk writes in a remarkable matter-of-fact style that the creature was vast in body with a crested head, teeth like a saw and a tail extending to enormous length. According to local legend, a mysterious bubbling can still be seen in one corner of the mere where the dragon disappeared, which is allegedly where the devil, who had taken the form of the beast seen by villagers, still lives to this day. One theory is that the dragon was in fact one of King Richard I's pet crocodiles, which was given to Richard as a gift from King Saladin during the 12th century Crusades. The crocodile would have been kept at the Tower of London alongside other curious creatures collected by the king, but it is believed to have escaped and ended up in the marshes near Bures. To this very day, a huge dragon still watches over the town of Bures. It was created in 2012 and is a 75 metre by 95 metre chalk outline of the dragon commissioned to celebrate the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Today's episode has covered dragons and mermen, big black dogs and disappearing towns. But I thought we would finish with a good old-fashioned ghost story. This story is taken from the Lowestoft Journal and was written on the 21st of June 2019 by Stacia Briggs and Shea Connor. Sea frets have often blurred the lines between this world and the next, and one such creature to appear from the mist is the sneering man of Corton who stalks the coastal road in front of terrified drivers, some of whom claim to have driven straight through him. In the summer edition of The Lantern in 1974, the Journal of the Borderline Science Investigation Group, based in Lowestoft, a terrifying tale was told by a man who had been driving home from Great Yarmouth to Lowestoft along the old A12, close to Carton Long Lane. As he neared the streetlights on the lane, His headlights illuminated someone, or something, standing in the road, directly in the path of his car. He told an investigator, I was struck most of all by the face, so much that I cannot recall seeing a body or even the outline of one. It was staring straight at me with a horrible sneer on its lips. It was not white or flimsy, but had a definite flesh and blood appearance. I braked hard but instead of hitting him, as seemed certain, my car went straight through him. It was not the first time that the witness to this horrifying figure had experienced something unusual on this stretch of road. Some months ago I was driving past more or less this same spot when despite my heater going at full blast, my car suddenly became icy cold and an unexplainable wave of fear swept over me. And my one thought was to accelerate away from that place as fast as I could. By the night in question, I had completely forgotten about the incident. Fearful that he had hit someone, although having felt no impact whatsoever, the man pulled onto the hard shoulder, got out of his car and nervously looked back to the road to see if there had been a terrible accident. There was nothing there. As soon as I realised that I had not knocked anyone down, my previous experience here came to mind, admitting that I was overcome by a fear bordering on panic. With no more to do, I leapt back into my car and put as much distance between me and that place as I could. 
I cannot get the memory of that horrible sneering face out of my mind. And even now the thought of it fills me with a strange feeling of apprehension tinged with fear. Close to Corton is Hopton, where a similarly horrifying ghost has been seen and driven through on the same stretch of road. In the winter edition of The Lantern in 1980, the tale of a low-stuffed man on the new A12 Hopton bypass was reported. Frank Colby of the British Transport Police was driving with his wife when he saw a man crossing the dual carriageway at Hopton. Stocky in build and wearing a calf-length, shapeless garment, he was hunched over and wearing fantastically huge footwear, and he was lifting them up well as he plodded across. Swiftly breaking, Mr Colby alerted his wife to the figure, but she was unable to see it. He watched the man cross to the central reservation before disappearing. One of the earliest recorded stories of Hopton's jaywalking ghost came from Roger Hammersley of Lowestoft, who, at the beginning of 1957, was driving in a convoy with a friend, Mr Orr Gardner from Yarmouth, to their hometown. Just before midnight, on the old A12 just south of Hopton, both men separately saw what Mr Hammersley described as the figure of a man wearing very large boots, a large fawn overcoat and a hat crossing the road in front of them. He drove close to the tall figure before realising it was no longer there, although he did not remember seeing it actually disappear. During an interview, Mr Hammersley admitted that many times prior to this encounter, he had often felt distinctly uneasy driving along this particular stretch of road, and that after seeing the ghost back in 1957, he avoided the Hopton stretch of the old A12 whenever he could. A year after Mr Colby saw the spectral figure in Hopton, in November 1981, Andrew Cutajar was driving on a wet and miserable night from Lowestoft to Great Yarmouth, when as he approached Hopton, he spotted grey mist in the middle of the carriageway ahead. As he drove closer, the mist took the form of a man, tall and dressed in a long coat or a cape, coming well past his knees. He had on old-fashioned, heavy, lace-up boots, and had long, straggly grey hair. The figure stood stock still in the middle of the road and as Kutajar frantically tried to brake to avoid hitting him, his car skidded out of control and straight through the figure, coming to a stop on the grass verge facing the wrong way. One theory put forward as to the identity of the figure is that of William Balls, Hopton's postman who worked himself to death in January 1899, having spent 22 years serving the village. He was found in a field close to where the hauntings occur at 10.30am on January the 2nd, lying face down in a pool of blood, having succumbed to pneumonia which had developed from winter flu. He was buried at Hopton Church, the ruins of which can be seen from the road. The postman had died aged just 40, and he had been warned by his doctor just days beforehand that he would die without rest. What am I to do? I must do my duty, he replied. On the day of his death, as usual, he set out on his 16-mile round at 6am and worked until 9.30am, at which point he started for home under rest before restarting work at 4.20pm. He was found in his father's field by a farm worker and left behind a pregnant wife, Angelina. Is William the phantom pedestrian postman of the A47, striding out to make one last delivery? So before we begin our dissection of these wonderful stories, I need to again give a massive shout out to the East Anglian Daily Times who do amazing stories about weird events in Suffolk. But they have this like interactive map and it's all based on weird Suffolk. And on the little map, it has this key where you've got like a little bubble with a ghost that represents a ghost story. And then there's like a bubble with a star that represents an unusual event. And then there's a little snake that represents a cryptid. And you can click on any one of those things on the interactive map and it'll tell you the story that is in that area. Oh, it's honestly, if you are at a loose end, if you want to sit and have a couple of hours to spare, sit and click the link in the description of this episode. Any of the links that are um, from the eadt.co.uk will have that little interactive map on it. And it is honestly, it's so fun. It is so fun, so comprehensive. There are so many stories. There were like, 
I couldn't even I couldn't even keep track of how many stories there were. There were so many that I could have gone through for this particular episode. So just definitely if you've got a few hours to kill, definitely check that out. And also there is the lowest stuffed journal, that article about the sneering man, which was written on the 21st of June 2019 by Stacia Briggs and Shea Connor. Really great article. I just wanted to finish on a good ghost story and that was a really good one to finish on. So let's crack on to our brief dissection. So firstly, the story about the merman or the wild man of Orford is actually recorded by the same monk who recorded the story of the green children of Woolpit. Now, that story of the green children of Woolpit is on Patreon and there's a couple of stories that I didn't put into this episode because they're on Patreon. This isn't like a Patreon clickbait episode, not at all. It just so happens that I've covered them before and I'm not going to do them again on the main episode because of that. But briefly, if you don't remember, The Green Children of Woolpit was a story where these children appeared in a village uh, and they were green skinned and didn't speak any English and they only ate green beans. And (laughs) I mean, that makes it sound really simplistic and completely mad. And unfortunately, the little boy died, but the girl was then assimilated into normal society and eventually her skin lost its green hue. Now, that story is really interesting because they talked about how they were uh, from a place that was under the sea and that they had heard voices in a cave and they went to investigate and ended up walking out of a cave in Woolpit and didn't know what people were saying, couldn't speak to anybody. Um, so there's some people that suggest it was like a time slip but it's also important to note that historically there have been people born really really without any paranormal implications with different coloured skin as in like blue skin or green skin there were a family in America I think uh, that were very famously blue skinned and apparently they had a genetic disposition towards it and then years of I think it was years of incest caused the gene to strengthen and the, the family ended up with blue tinged skin and honestly sometimes I think that real life is even stranger than fiction but the same monk who recorded the story of the green children also recorded the story of the merman of Orford and look here's the thing right is it that It was somebody who had an intellectual disability or was neurodivergent or even, for example, was deaf and lived on the fringes of society and had learned to live on the fringes of society. Because we all know that society at that time was not kind to anybody who was perceived as different. Even society today is often not kind to people who are perceived as different. But back then, we were particularly cruel humanity when I say we I mean humanity but we were particularly cruel to people who were perceived as different so is it possible that actually this person wasn't magical or otherworldly they were just perceived as different and the people just couldn't understand or rationalize how this person could live and survive on the edges of society I mean that doesn't explain the apparently incredible feats of swimming that this person was able to perform and I knew absolutely nothing about the wood woes nothing at all But apparently they were deemed to be like fairy creatures, almost like elves, tricksters that lived in the forest. Sometimes they were seen with rudimentary tools. There were some accounts of wood wolves attacking villages and towns if they felt as though they were threatened or felt as though they were needed to. But generally they just kept out of the way of people. They weren't interested in people. They lived their own lives in the forest. And we often imagine that fairy folk or the fae are little spindly creatures with wings. But the legend says otherwise, like legends from all across the world talk about the Fae as like some being smaller than average humans, but actually sometimes they're human sized and human shaped. Sometimes they were glowing, sometimes they're really beautiful. And in this instance, they were seen as being sort of hairier versions of humans that live wild in the forest. We always, of course, have to accept the possibility that this just never happened to. It doesn't make for a very interesting dissection of the story. But is it a case of it being a word of warning, like a story of warning of you don't know what lives in the sea. So therefore you have to be careful when you are out there. You have to not go into the sea and not be flippant about how powerful the sea is and what curiosities the sea can hold. And listen, that brings me to the dragon story, right? I'm I'm going to I'm just going to put it out there. I believe I believe it. I believe it actually happened, but I believe it was a crocodile. I obviously don't think it was a dragon. I think it was a crocodile. And it was only when I got to the end of that story and they said about Richard I or Richard the Lionheart having 
crocodiles in the Tower of London that were gifted to him that I went, oh my God, of course. We know that people kept all sorts of mad animals in the Tower of London. They were keeping like elephants, giraffes, bears, all sorts of things. Again, I do not condone in any way, shape or form the captivity of wild animals. But these wild exotic creatures were kept in the Tower of London and crocodiles can grow to absolutely enormous sizes. I was looking up how big crocodiles can get for this story and they can get really big. There were like prehistoric crocodiles, like genus of crocodiles that were like 50 feet in length. They could get up to that big. And obviously there are crocodiles knocking about today, but the saltwater crocodiles more so that are like 20 to 30 feet. They are enormous. So if you're somebody in a rural village in East Suffolk and a crocodile shows up, comes out with the, comes out with the water, you're going to think that thing's a dragon. You're firing your arrows at it and it's not piercing the skin because obviously crocodiles are made of scales or whatever. They've got scaly skin. You're going to be shitting yourself. But you know what? I will give it to these people. I'll give it to the people of Suffolk. They saw an opportunity. Life gave them lemons and they ate some dragon roasted sheep. They said, you know what? Things have been bad. We're very sad that shepherd has died. But also some barbecued lamb sounds like an absolute vibe. They are like... All that crazy monster hunting has made me hungry. And guess what? The nature has provided what the monster taketh away in the form of the loss of our lovely shepherd. The monster has also provided in the form of some delicious sheep meat. I couldn't think of what sheep meat was there. Mutton, lamb, whatever it was. Lamb chops, I don't know. But look, they saw an opportunity and they took it. And I I respect that. I respect that an awful lot. And you just can't beat a story of a phantom hitchhiker or a phantom person walking along the roads. Less so when he's like sneering at you through the car window. We can have less of that, please. But the big boots are almost comical. You know, and I always think if I'm going to die, I don't want to relive work. I don't want to relive work. To be really frank, actually, if I was stuck in the afterlife reliving trudging the roads delivering posts to ungrateful people I'd probably be sneering as well for sure but I do think it's amazing that like multiple different people had these experiences of this same entity on the side of the road and a really strange entity you know usually we have like a woman in white or you know you have somebody who you get a brief glimpse of them and then they're gone but this seems to be somebody who's almost aware that they're dead and trying to make people as uncomfortable as possible a man with like calf length jacket and big boots and long straggly hair like that's a really striking figure and then to have a sneering horrible terrifying face as well on top of that you're not going to forget that very very quickly so in summary do i think that all these stories should be taken with a pinch of salt absolutely but are they wonderful stories they are incredible stories they are stories that kind of make the fabric of a community they are stories that are really wild and carefree and important and they're representative of a completely different time in society but also people are still intrigued by them to this day and honestly i could not recommend highly enough that you go on to eadt.co.uk on any of the um links in the description of this episode and have a look at some of those stories from around suffolk like They are incredible. We went to a church where the devil is supposedly locked in the basement. And if you put a handkerchief down and run around the church seven times, the handkerchief will be gone and you'll hear him rattling around the basement. We also went to the church where Black Shook apparently murdered two parishioners. So Black Shook was the big black dog. The full Black Shook story is also on Patreon if you want to listen to it. And the scorch marks from Black Shook's claws are still on the door and that church was freaky that church gave me the heebie-jeebies for real we went to an old leper colony that is also supposed to be haunted we went to the rendlesham forest which is obviously the home to britain's roswell you know a really famous ufo encounter but it's also got its own mermaid story like there are so many amazing stories that you can just explore and dive into there's stories of spontaneous combustion there's stories of witches all sorts of everything and honestly it is so worth having a look 
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to submit your own ghost story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for extra spooky content, including the story of the Green Children of Woolpit and including the story of Black Shook, you can sign up to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad-free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.